Hey everyone, my name is Aditya and I'm a developer advocate here at Salesforce. And in this quick take, you're going to see how you can use Salesforce data in your Apex tests. If you're new to Apex testing, I would strongly recommend you check out this quick take, which is linked in the description below. Let's take this Apex class for example. It contains a method that queries for accounts, filtered based on the account type parameter passed to it. And here is a test class for this method. We simply call the method and pass a parameter value. Here I'm trying to get the accounts of type customer direct. In my org, if I look at the list of accounts, you can see that I have seven accounts with the type customer direct. So in my test class, I check for the same using an assert statement. Now, when I run the test, notice what happens. It fails. It says the method returned zero rows. Why is that? That's because by default, the existing data in your org is not visible to test methods with the exception of certain setup objects. As a best practice, you should always create your own test data for each test. Why? There's two reasons. First, your org might not always have the data you need, both for your positive and negative tests. Second, the data in an org is not consistent. Now between test runs, the data in your org can change. Records can be added, modified or removed. Also, the data in different orgs is different. So your assert statements might pass in one org, but fail in the other. For example, your sandbox might only have two accounts, but your production org can have 10. So if your test method checks if the number of accounts returned by this method is two, it will pass in the sandbox, but it will fail in production, which is why you should always create your own test data. In some scenarios, like testing report data or field history records, you might need to have access to org data because you can't create those records through Apex. In those cases, you can annotate your test class with the see all data is equal to true annotation. This gives your test methods access to the actual data in your org. Again, it's not a best practice to do this for all your tests. You should always create your own test data and only use see all data is equal to true when absolutely needed. Another important thing to remember about data in Apex tests is that it is transient and it is not committed to the database, which means the data is present only as long as your test is running. Now the advantages with this, first, you don't need to delete test data or clean up data after a test is done running. Second, let's say you're using CL data to access existing org data. This transient behavior of tests makes it so that the changes to existing records like updates or deletions that you do as a part of your test don't persist. So after a test is run, the org remains exactly the way it was before the tests. Now that you know the importance of test data and its behavior, let's now see how you can create test data in your test classes. Each test method runs independently, so you need to create test data inside each test method. So let's create a few account records in this test method. I'm creating accounts with different types. Based on the data that I created here, I also need to modify my assert statements. Here, I've created only two customer direct accounts, so I change the assert to two. I can even go one step further and check if the account names returned by the method match the accounts I created here. Now remember, you need to create test data for each test method. For example, if I had to add one more test method to test another Apex method like get accounts filtered by name, I have to add test data to that as well. Now when I run the test, you can see that both my test methods have passed. Instead of having to create test data in each method, wouldn't it be great if you can create the test data only once 
and access the created data in every method. That's exactly where the test setup methods are helpful. Test setup methods are defined in a test class itself. They take no arguments and return no value. And most importantly, they have the test setup annotation. If a test class contains a test setup method, the Apex testing framework automatically executes this test setup method first before any of the other test methods in the class. The records that have been created as a part of this test setup method are available to all the test methods and are rolled back at the end of the test class execution. Now imagine if a test method changes those records, such as field updates or deletes or so on. Those changes are actually rolled back after each test method finishes execution so that the next executing test method gets the original unmodified records. Here is the updated test class where all the data creation happens in the test setup method. And in each test method, I now only need to run my testing logic without having to worry about creating test data inside this method or calling the test setup method manually and so on. Now, if I run this test class, you can see that it executes perfectly just like before. The test setup methods can actually reduce your test execution times, especially when you're working with many records. So ensure you're using test setup methods wherever possible. Now, let's say you have to create hundreds of test accounts and each of these accounts must have unique field values. Instead of having to write code for all of this, you can actually load sample data from a CSV file. Here is a CSV file with sample data for different accounts. Make sure the column names in your CSV file match the field names in Salesforce. Here I have 16 accounts of the type customer direct. In order to load the data from the CSV file into my tests, I first need to upload this file as a static resource. Next, in my code, I call the test.loadData method, in which I specify the type of object it has to create, and I pass the name of the static resource. Since the CSV file has 16 customer direct accounts, I change this assert to reflect the same, and all the other assert statements according to the new test data. Now, if I deploy and run my test class, you can see that it executes successfully. Since Apex executes on the cloud, it has different limits on different operations that you can perform to prevent you from overutilizing the computing resources that are shared with everyone. These are called governor limits. So for example, in a transaction, the number of DML statements that you can write is limited to 150. So the DML statements include inserts, updates, deletes, undelete, and so on. Now, whenever a test class runs, the test data creation and test execution both happen in the same transaction. Depending on how much test data you're inserting, a certain number of these limits is already consumed by your test data creation logic by the time your actual method is executed. This will hamper testing how close your code is to reaching these governor limits when it is running independently. This is why we have two methods called test.starttest and test.stoptest. The start test method marks the point in your test code where the test actually begins and stop test marks the point where your test ends. Here test refers to the business logic that you're testing and not the things like creating test data, fetching the data needed for your tests and so on. Now, what's the purpose of these two methods? Any code that executes between these two methods is assigned a new set of governor limits. The code inside start and stop block has one set of limits and the code outside has another set. The code outside, whether before or after that start and stop methods, shares the same limit as shown on the slide. Let's see this with an example. I've added a few log statements to show how many DML statements are consumed at different points in my Apex test. 
The first statement I added is inside the test setup method where I'm inserting a few dummy account records. Next, I've added one log statement right inside my test method. Then I'm inserting a few dummy contact records and I've added a log statement right after that. The next log statement I've added is after test.startTest where I'm actually going to test my Apex logic. I'm testing an Apex method that creates a case record. I'm calling it three times, so it creates three cases. I've put a log after this logic right before the test.stopTest method to see how many DML statements we've consumed so far. And finally, one after the test.stopTest method. In the output, you can see that as expected, when the test starts, all the 150 DML statements are available to me. After creating the test data in the test setup method, one statement is consumed. After inserting the test contacts inside my test method, two are consumed. But notice what happens inside test.startTest. You can see that all the 150 statements are now available to me again because the code in this segment gets a new set of limits. Once my three cases are created, you can see that we've consumed three DML statements as expected. Notice what happens outside test.stopTest. It shows I've consumed two DML statements, not three, because the code after the stop method shares the limits with the code before the start method, as I've shown you in the slide previously. So as a best practice, Again, make sure you're always using test.startTest and test.stopTest when testing your Apex logic. This was just a glimpse into how you can work with Salesforce data in your tests. To see more examples, check out the tests folder in Apex recipes. The link is in the description below. If you found this video helpful, hit the like button. Also, don't forget to click on subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified whenever we publish new videos.